Thank you, Christine. Uh, my name's Chris Kroom. I, um, I'm going to wait just a second as we are finished populating or we good? Uh, there's just one or two more people coming in. Okay, I'll wait for those two folks to get in and uh, then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, it looks like I've waited those few moments there. So my name, again, my name is Chris. I am director of the Aquatic Center at Denison University. Um, I'll let Trevor introduce himself and then we'll get to our special guests for the day as well and get this underway. Um, good afternoon, guys. Um, my name is Trevor Burnett. I'm the competitive sports coordinator at Texas A&M San Antonio. Uh, like I said, you know, We've got two special guests with us from the reopening work team from NURSA. Uh, if you saw them last week, they were on a reopening panel as well. We have um, Greta Geis, if I said your last name right, I'm hoping, close, maybe. Close. Uh, and then we also have um, Rob Bolton. Uh, Greta's from North, uh, Northwest Iowa Community College, Rob from Pepperdine University. So. Um, you know, I guess I'm just going to ask the first question to get this started. If you have questions, type those into the chat and then um, we're going to monitor that, get those out to our, uh, our group here and get those answered as best as we possibly can today. So we'll go for the whole hour if we, um, you know, if we can. Hopefully we, uh, we have lots of good interactions today. So you know, the question I was just going to ask that, you know, especially our two um, reopening specialists is, you know, as you looked at your plans and I know you know, one of you is open, one of you is not. You know, what is the, what is like one burning thing that you wish you would have known, you know, when you were making all these plans and now that you've opened, what is that one thing you're like, oh, I wish I would have known this. Rob, do you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I would, I think the thing that I keep saying to colleagues that have asked me that question, Chris, is if you can get your cleaning supply chain locked down, <laughs> that would be my biggest suggestion. It's super hard right now because right now, especially here in the Midwest, based on our uh, governor's proclamation for reopening practices, we are not the only industry that wants these supplies. People who never had to worry about uh, sanitation, disinfecting, and cleaning to the level that as a recreation and fitness facility, I've always been super proud of our cleanliness and our attention to that. Um, it's been important to us long before COVID-19, but now other industries are taking those practices into effect. So lock that down. That was something that I, I was saying earlier before we jumped on that 72 hours before we opened, I was still trying to make sure that we had a supply chain to ensure that we weren't going to be open for one week and then have to close because we couldn't keep up with the rigorous cleaning practices. Um, also staffing, you know, I think everybody is feeling like if our students aren't on campus, how will we staff our facility? And that has been true for me as well. Um, so staffing has been challenging and then staffing in the face of a positive COVID-19 test for uh, staffing. So I've had a, two instances already of COVID-19 exposures um, on our staff and handling that has been an exercise in understanding public health policies and procedures and that is not easy. Um, so just be prepared for what those positive cases will mean and who your resources are. I think those are the things that I found that out relatively early, um, but it's been challenging. Yeah, I would say, you know, we, there's not a lot that, that would fit um, as far as what we would do differently or what we've learned. I think one thing that came about is that I did rely too much on uh, just thinking that my direct supervisor would be passing down all the information with our university's planning committee. And, in, and we were very active at trying to create our reopening strategy early on. Um, but then we came to find out that other plans were being made. And we'd spent a lot of time, for example, with our group fitness program and trying to figure out how that was going to run, only to find out a month after that they were going to convert it into a classroom. So it was just 
you know, I know it's a very dynamic situation that we're all dealing with, but, um, you know, we did spend a lot of time and resources trying to figure out some things that we would have been told early on, like, you know, there, there's some things that we shouldn't, we wouldn't need to worry about that would have been helpful just so we could focus on, on the priorities. Yeah, I would, I would echo that too, Rob. That's a good point. I've had similar situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Greta, you were talking about, you know, having a staff member, um, you know, testing positive. You know, what does that look like for y'all when that happens? What kind of a process do you have to go through? You know, it might be helpful for the rest of us if we do have that happen. You bet. Okay, so neither of my staff members have tested positive. Thankfully, I'm going to knock on some wood here, um, but they had direct exposure to family members who did test positive. And so um, I think I said this last on last week's call as we're at Roundtable as well, but my saving grace has been having a contact on campus who is our point person for COVID-19. So our human resources director on our campus is that person. And so I have a direct line to her to find out what I need to do and how we need to proceed. And I see there's a question in the chat about contact tracing. And so she's my resource for that contact tracing process. Um, so first tip, find that person on your campus. Um, similar to what Rob was saying, don't assume that they're gonna tell you, you're gonna have to find that person and you're gonna have to ask them. Um, so find that person, get their ear. But for us, these two folks didn't test positive. They themselves tested negative, but were directly exposed to a positive COVID-19 test. Uh, so they had to self-isolate for 14 days because their test was negative on our campus. And Iowa Public Health said that we did not have to disclose that. If that individual staff member wanted to disclose to their coworkers as to why they were not on the schedule for two weeks, they could. And um, in both instances, they did and have. Um, just for, I, I, I thank them for their um, posterity and, and being open with that, because I think the more open we can be, the better off we all are. Uh, but for us, we didn't have to shut down. We were able to just have that person self-isolate for two weeks and then they could come back um, on staff. In these cases, those people were not symptomatic um, and their tests were negative. So for me, um, it's thankfully been okay, uh, but we were quite sure on day one of phase two of our reopening strategy here at the College Rec Center that we were maybe going to have to shut down had um, that one, one of the staff members tested positive. Mostly because, as I said before, student staffing is very difficult. And this summer um, to reopen our facility, I have a lot of student employees working a lot of hours. And this particular employee was one of my nearly 40 hour a week people. And had they tested positive themselves, we would have probably been shut down again on day one of phase two of our reopening strategy. So it can change in a heartbeat. And I think that's the big message too, is I think adaptability is, is gonna be the name of the game, not just for the fall, but probably the entire school year is figuring out how do we adapt to an ever-changing, ever-evolving situation. That sounds a lot like what a lot of everybody else is experiencing. Um, Jeremy is asking, you know, and, and not just our, you know, our guests, anybody can chime in on this. What, uh, what are your, what's your intramural programming looking like and what are your club sports looking like for the fall? And I guess we can start with the group here and then open it up to anybody. What are your, what are your plans for IMs? So I, I think this is gonna be, um, Kind of one of those situations where it's per uh, school, um, what you know, where you, what state you're living in. Um, a lot of that for us in Texas, um, we are going to be, you know, it's what I'm, what I'm being the competitive sports coordinator. What I'm planning to do is I already do something. Um, I used it, I was using it as an advertising tool, but I call it Rec Day Thursday, and it's literally we go from 11 to 3. We do little games where you're competing. Um, and we try to tie them to whatever sport we're playing. So if it's flag football, we'll have like a trash can toss. We'll do um, little football related events. It's literally, you know, they walk up and we catch them 
between class. You don't have to be in athletic attire. Um, we're going to do little things like that. I'm going to stick with that. Um, that might be what my intramural program looks like um, this year. Uh, I think with sport clubs, it's going to depend on, you know, who, where they're competing or who, what, you know, what that league, um, what guidelines they're following, whether it's NCAA, um, NAIA, however that looks. So I know NURSA when, you know, they're going to come out with something for sports, obviously. Um, I'm not sure where we're at with that or how far, you know, when that's going to happen. But um, nurses, just like NCAA or NAIA, they're nationwide. So they have to figure out something that's going to fit the mold for everybody, not just Texas or not just, you know, California or wherever you're located. So um, I think it's going to be a lot of up in the air and last minute stuff, honestly as far as how that's going to play out for sports. Um, but yeah, we, we were at um, sports with no more than four people. So obviously that's very difficult to do. So if you want, the best thing you could do is spike ball with gloves, I guess, but still um, trying to avoid that contact. So for me, I'm going to stick with our rec day Thursday model where we're doing little games um, that relate to whatever sport we have going on. You can probably still do table tennis. Um, stuff like that so anybody else got uh ideas or or options that they have thought about yeah trevor so you know we were also operating and we still are kind of not knowing what the group size is that's going to be permitted um you know there's changes constantly like for example now they're saying in la county that masks are going to be required for exercise and activity which is kind of nuts to me but that initially wasn't on the table and now it is so along with my intramural coordinator we basically looked at what we currently offered what we could do if anything to reduce exposure or have smaller you know teams sizes so for us in the fall we typically run flag football and indoor volleyball so we looked at you know flag football we broke it down what can we do to you know limit the you know, the contact of the ball, which is the main thing that everyone would be sharing and touching. How could we, you know, reduce the number of size of the teams? How could we uh, reduce exposure for the officials? So just breaking it down by sport. Then we figured, you know, indoor volleyball probably wouldn't be something we could solve because the ball is obviously being touched by everybody going back and forth. So what we were going to do was try to move towards uh, indoor soccer, doing like a futsal, because we figured that would be less exposure um so it was just really lit literally looking at each sport that we offer figuring out if there's a way that we could work with that sport and if not substituting so that we had some alternatives that we haven't done like over the line which is a yeah. uh two or three person softball type game so there's a lot of limited exposure in that so we were looking at that like you said we've considered spike ball um we have a disc golf course so just being creative and then looking at more one-off tournaments versus seasons as well um, that we can do stuff like that and then in esports which we have we just started so and then as far as club sports similar to you it's going to a lot of it is going to depend on the the leagues that we're in because you know our rugby league is putting out certain guidelines and lacrosse and everybody's going to have their own guidelines so it's really just keeping a pulse on what they're doing and then also understanding the guidelines that you have to fit in so you know, all those groups could come back and say, yeah, we're good to go. But then now our school is saying, well, there's going to be a limit on how many students could be in a car together. So now that's a whole nother piece of that. Well, how are we going to travel to a game? You know, if, if we're normally carpooling or taking vans and now everyone has to drive alone. I just, so all these little things, I think the biggest takeaway is just try to break down each element and just look at all the details, walk through a whole game day, of, of a club sport and all the things that could possibly be issues and try to solve those problems ahead of time. And the other thing I might add to that is um, scheduling. So, you know, we, we schedule our games every hour, right? So maybe spacing out to where you schedule your game. If it starts at six, it ends at 650 and then the next game starts at 730 or something. So you don't have that big um, crisscross or interaction with, with all the different teams and, you know, some of y'all's spaces are probably a lot bigger than ours, but um, we have one little field that barely hits the size of a, of a, I mean, it's barely 100 yards by barely 50 yards. So um, it's not even a football field. So um, a lot of our students get to, or, you know, get close on the sidelines. So that was one thing we looked at is scheduling also. Um, 
And then Janice, I think we're kind of all in the same boat. I'm pretty sure we're still, as far as AM San Antonio, um, we still have our, our travel restrictions. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of it's just going to depend on what these governing bodies decide and then how your university handles that situation. In, in Iowa, we are a little bit different, maybe weird. <laughs> we are having high school baseball and softball right now. We're heading into uh, tournament play next week. Um, and then we, I also uh, work as a supervisor for our sports shooting team, which is a, a Iowa Community College Athletic Conference sanctioned team. And we are making plans for a fall season. Now, sports shooting is one of those sports that it's pretty easy to not be next to people. It's literally part of the safety parameters for sports shooting. Um, but we met as athletic directors last week, and the pending um, NJCAA parameters, we are going to have fall sports, indoor sports competitions, though we know uh, no fans, no spectators, outdoor, each institution can make that decision as needed and we're not restricted on travel. Now, as an institution for a summer semester, we're not traveling, we're not going, you know, any of our meetings with other college uh, personnel are Zoom, but the fall, we're hoping, we're, we're basically making plans to have it. So I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying it's wrong, but that's where we're at in Iowa. Yeah, and I, I think one of the other one of the considerations we're looking at is, you know, our rugby league is allowing play, but our university is saying absolutely no way. You know, just looking at, you know, especially with rugby, looking at the, you know, that's a perfect example, looking at the liability of just, you know, how that sport is played and just the possibilities for contact there. So, you know, you can, I think that's the big thing to look to is what's your university going to do as well? What are they recommending? You know, we talked with our general counsel quite a bit on these kinds of things. And she was like, yeah, that sounds like a really bad idea. So, um, and I'm, I'm known for bad ideas. So if she's telling me it's a bad idea, then all right, I'm not going to get any chuckles from the group today so um all right well i'll try i'll try those bad jokes later um another question uh from sue weaver uh, asking a little bit about what are people planning for you know group fitness are you doing indoors how do you do that what kind of safety precautions i guess you know things to look at for group fitness as we you know we get ready to reopen so we are doing group fitness we just started it we're not having much takers so it's a soft opening of group fitness. Um, I can't see Sue, but hi, Sue. Um, so we are doing it. We just started. We're doing ours in a boutique style. So we're requiring small classes, um, 10 people and less. We have a pretty large group fitness studio. So that allows us to have more than plenty of space in between people. Uh, they have to if they have equipment that they need for that class, they have to check that out prior to the class at the front desk, and then they check it back in after they're done, and we sanitize all of that equipment. If it's a class where the instructor might have done a hands-on adjustment or you know, manual technique manipulation, we're of course not doing that. Um, they have to pre-register for the class, so we have an online registration process. They have to pre-register for that class and we're doing it boutique style so that they they're basically registering for one class at a time and it will make for canceling classes a little easier should we have a problem with it again we're having less than a handful of people in our classes um, it's summertime so that's you know thing number one to remember uh, thing number two is we still have a fairly covid cautious group and we our facility is for our faculty staff and students but we also sell community membership and a lot of our community members are still pretty covid cautious around here um, but we're rolling it out those who are loyal group fitness participants are super excited um, but we're starting really slowly like four classes a week 
um, at very different times. So we have plenty of time to disinfect equipment and classroom space in between. I don't know if that helps you at your institution, but we are starting that and just so I would slow and slow. And I, I think, I mean, Janice, touched on it but looking at your outdoor spaces so we don't have a, a rec center per se we have a, two facilities that are just right around 2,000 square feet um, so we have a pavilion though so that's where we're planning to do um, anything on campus as far as our fitness classes um, our pavilion is the size of a basketball court so you can easily and it's outdoors which is recommended if you can do anything outdoors um, and then the other part of that is we've had quite a bit of success with our online um, fitness classes that our fitness instructors have been doing basically since, um, let's see, spring break. Uh, they got it all together and they've been doing it since then. So they've, they've pretty much perfected that method now that we're in July. Um, so they've, they've done a good job with that. So um, they're going to keep doing that also. So that's what a lot of our um, fitness classes are going to look like. And then we will also provide, uh, we won't do as many per week, but we will do them out, outdoors, whether it's, you know, on a lawn or at the, our pavilion. So I would, yeah, look at those outdoor spaces that are relatively close to your, your rec center. It's good advertisement too. Yeah, and, and I guess don't be afraid to try new formats of, of your programs as well. You know, we're looking at, you know, how do we transfer our stuff from the out, you know, from inside to the outside? What does that look like? Um, you know, we're going to continue to do some virtual because we're going to have to just with the numbers that we pull for some of our classes. Zumba is usually packed for us, so it makes sense to do it a lot. You know, do it virtually. Um, you know, how do we do uh, you know, cycling classes? You know, we're looking at you know, can we move those bikes outside and inside every day? Do we want to move out to our indoor track? What, you know, what's that going to look like for us and how, how can we do that that safely? So I just, you know, use your creativity cap. Put your thinking cap on. I know we've been doing that for 15 weeks now, but put that thinking cap back on one more time and, you know, just think about something that maybe you hadn't thought of before. That, that would be my biggest, you know, my biggest. Chris and I were actually talking last week and how we kind of throw it at the wall. Mm -hmm. And if it sticks, play with it. If not, then... Try again. That's the definition add, of small programs, isn't it? Yeah, that's what exactly. I think. Don't be afraid to try. I mean, yeah. the worst that can happen is it doesn't work and you don't do it again. And, and just to add on to that, I would say for us, when we were considering it, you know, my primary goal was how do we serve our students first and foremost? And, and how do I create a safe, plan that I can propose to the administration, the school to show them that we're taking all the considerations. And so one of the things that we were looking at is we also have community members. And I know our school is going to be implementing pretty rigid um, standards for the students and staff once we do open if that happens. And we wouldn't have that kind of control with the community. So, you know, I was trying to advocate, look, if we're going to do this, we know that one there'll be less capacity to serve because the classes are gonna be smaller. So we don't want to give space to people in the community. We want the students to be served first. And secondly, just seeing what's going on in general and in, in a lot of communities where people are at different levels on how they're you know, uh, following guidelines. We knew we had a, bit, a little bit more control of our students in the messaging, but community members could come in and have totally separate views. And we didn't wanna have those kind of conflict. So for us, we were saying, look, let's just in this first phase, take out that community element. And obviously we had to deal with other pieces of the university because that's a whole part of fundraising for them to, to have those people on campus. But again, it's all about right now, what do we need to focus on and safety was priority and, and serving our students. So that was a consideration that, that we had was eliminating the community member for now. Yeah. And we talked about that too, Rob. Um, and based on our numbers in the summer semester, we felt that we could handle it um, and it has worked out okay for us, but we um, did eliminate guest passes. So we have traditionally allowed, you know, somebody's visiting their grandma and they can come in for five bucks, they can exercise. We are not allowing that whatsoever. Um, and like our group fitness classes, those are, um, we, we basically priced out our non-members. So if you're a member, it's easy to 
take the classes. It's not uh, the big restriction, but we priced out our non-members on our classes. So that way when we are doing contact tracing, and I think somebody said something about contact tracing, when we are doing contact tracing, we are only serving people that we know and have good contact information from uh, so that if we have to go to that stage in the COVID-19 process, we know who we need to contact and how to contact them. Yeah, I, I think that's what we're really looking at is how do we you know, best serve our, you know, the mission and the, you know, the vision of our university and it all boils down to serving our students. So, you know, like I think everybody here, we're not allowing, well, a lot of people here, we're not allowing, you know, community into, you know, into the rec center once we reopen. It's just, you know, it's going to be all we can do to serve our students and you know, the faculty staff on our campus, let alone trying to, you know, to worry about the community or, you know, we even had the discussion on Monday about, um, you know, do we let Emeriti in? And, you know, that's another group that we're not going to allow in, mainly just because, again, we can't control, you know, who they're interacting with. A lot of our emeriti are in a more vulnerable population anyway, being, you know, older retired folks. And, you know, we just we can't, you know, we, we, <laughs> we just can't. It's, you know, for safety and you know, for the security of both them and for our university, we just can't at this point. So, um, no, I think these are all great. Um, so, another question that came up I saw in the chat was, you know, outdoor recreation. Is anybody doing anything like local trips? So, you know, biking, hiking, paddle sports, workshops, things that, you know, might be out more in nature, but again, you might have some more contact with folks. We are um, at our institution. We're still doing some of those student activities. Um, they are only student activities, and we only have about 200 students that are taking any set form of class on campus this summer, which is probably more than a lot of people have on campus right now. Um, I keep saying we're kind of like, we're being guinea pigs over here in Iowa. Uh, and so we have been doing that. Our student activities coordinator um, that works with me has been doing some biking. Uh, we have a beautiful trail system. Um, she's been doing, we've got some river space here and doing some kayaking. We have um, some, uh, like strawberry patches and things like that. We're doing all of those things. We're still offering those activities. Almost everything she's done, I cannot think of something that's been indoors. It's all been outdoors. And her biggest challenge is offering that and then they have to drive themselves because we cannot offer campus uh, transportation. So participation hasn't been great. It's been, you know, that handful, a couple handfuls of students that are living in the dorms and are far away from home um, that need something to do, but at least we're still offering it. Um, and again, it's been all outdoor. She's really, really pushing social distancing and, um, but transportation is her issue. If there's somebody who doesn't have the way to get to where they're going. Yeah, and I would say just in general, I mean, all these things, it just takes a good operational process of how you think through every little detail and literally visualize, you know, the start of the event through the event to the end and all the things that would impact it. I think that's just a good exercise. And if you start applying it across the board for, for an intramural sport, for an outdoor trip, for something in your fitness area, it just becomes second nature and you can really see some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. And I think, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of commonality. So again, when we walk through an outdoor trip, is there any going to be any shared equipment? Um, again, the travel issue, how can you get around that? The size of the groups. And if you start to figure out solutions to that, you'll see that there are opportunities. So for us, for example, we did relook at our trips and we just scaled back the size. We looked at, you know, having students bringing their own equipment, not doing our rental equipment. Um, you know, we still have to figure out the travel, but we figured if we did closer locations, that would reduce the, um, uh, the, the impact of travel. Um, so, you know, just, just thinking of stuff like that, but having an operational procedure that's consistent of how you think through these, these different steps will be really helpful. Well, and I think that is a good tie back to Kind of the reason that Rob and I are here is we served on this reopening considerations work group uh, for NURSA and that was one of the things that 
we really wanted to get across when we put this document together was that this document or site or however you want to um, say it is a way for our colleagues to walk through all of those things that Rob was just talking about. So when you think about, you know, your if you're reopening facility wide and how you're going to pursue that plan or group fitness, as we were talking about, or, you know, your trips or your outdoor activities, whatever it is, that hopefully these NURSA reopening considerations can be a little bit of a checklist to help you walk through all of those scenarios and all of those, you know, touch points and things that you really need to consider before you implement it. You know, we didn't, put it together to say, these are the recommendations and this is what's gonna work for every institution, facility and program. It really is about, well, if you are choosing to reopen, here's things that we suggest considering. They might not all work for you because of your facility size, your institution size, your on-campus population, you know, the amount of staffers that you have, all of those different you know, I don't have a climbing wall. So last week people were talking about the climbing wall and I was like, I can't help on that one. I didn't have to worry about that consideration. I was able to move on. Um, so as you're planning those things, yeah, I agree with Rob. You just really have to walk through all of those considerations and think about, you know, step-by-step, step, how can we scale this back? How can we communicate it differently? You know, how can we clean it more frequently? How can we limit things? And that's what that that's what that site and those considerations really amount to. Yeah, it's really about getting to kind of the core of who you are and what you do and figuring out what's the most relevant, what's the what, what do we need to do the most, and then kind of trimming away some of the excess and saying, okay, well, we can probably get away with that without doing that this year, or maybe we need to modify it to be a different way. Um, if anybody has not seen those reopening considerations, I just dropped the link for that into the chat. So you know, feel free to go ahead and you know, navigate over there if you, you know, haven't seen that yet. Um, one question that's just come up, and, and I, I'm not, I don't know the answer to this one, but uh, Christine might, is the NURSA Champions, uh, Championship Series occurring this fall? The decision hasn't been made on that yet. They are doing some assessment work, um, sending out some surveys, collecting data, from folks, um, you know, all the same questions that we've been talking about here about, you know, ability to travel and all kinds of differences around uh, the country, state by state. So they're compiling that information and they're going to make a determination, but that hasn't been finalized yet. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Chris, I just wondered if I could too, because you just said something that reminded me, you know, there's a lot of challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunities if you look at this um, a certain way. And I've been on a lot of uh, roundtable calls with executives in the fitness industry from the commercial industry, and a lot of them are seeing opportunities as well. And I think for us, you know, we may have programs or, you know, just policies or procedures that we've been doing for so long that maybe aren't the best way to do things. And this is a great environment to now reevaluate those things and also implement change and take it up to the administration and use it under the umbrella of like, well, we can't do it because of this, but maybe that's just not the best way to operate anymore. And there's, I mean, for example, you know, the Zoom um, doing, you know, more online programming and things like that, you know, for small schools like us, the expense of hiring instructors and personal training and all the things Maybe there's a better model now that technology definitely can afford with doing more online personal training, more online group fitness. I think there's a lot of positives that can come out of this if you just have the mindset of, you know, really evaluating what you do. And, you know, just because things have been done for so long, really, is there a better way or is it even necessary to do it anymore? You know, we're seeing, for example, group fitness is really kind of fading out for us and we're we're fighting so hard every year to keep it going but if students are in a different place so when I walk into our weight room I see most of the students are on their phones watching a fitness app so now we're thinking well why don't what we actually did last year before this was started creating open time in our group fitness studio for 
app-based fitness training because we had the dumbbells, we had all the small accessories, and we said, this is time to come in, use your app. That way you're not taking up space in the weight room. But again, it's just kind of how can you use this to your advantage? And I think, um, you know, as small schools, we have to really put on that thinking cap and, and be more creative at this point for maybe lasting opportunities and change that's positive. I 100% agree with Rob. We are doing similar things over here, even though we are reintroducing group fitness. We are also working on um, our fitness on demand uh, opportunities because we do have a lot of group fitness studio time where that room is empty or if it's not empty um, and it's not a, our class, we have students that are going in there with their phones and they're doing a YouTube video. So how can we capitalize on that? How can we capture that? And we are gonna have a membership tier here in the fall that will be tied to Fitness On Demand. So they'll have to have a membership. So we tie them to their membership, but they can also access that Fitness On Demand either in our facility, in our studio, or Fitness On Demand has an option where we can give them login information for at home. So we're tying it to a membership tier and we're pursuing it that way. But I haven't had a lot of support on that in the past, but I wanna capitalize on where we are to move forward on that. And we've also done a lot of long-term recurring group fitness classes where people had to commit as instructors to every Tuesday at five, they were doing the same class and that was participant-based because they, they want that consistency. But for an instructor and for rural Northwest Iowa, uh, let me tell you, instructors and personal trainers aren't growing on trees over here in Iowa uh, in, the, in the country. So that has been challenging for us. But now as we reintroduce group fitness, we're doing them in a more boutique style is what I'm saying. And so they are able to kind of cherry pick the days, times, weeks that work for them. Um, and I'm capitalizing on the changes COVID's bringing me and making it work for our facility. And I'm already getting positive feedback from instructors. They're pumped because this is what they want to work best with their schedule. Um, so yeah, um, I saw a chat from Brenna. I'm super curious, Brenna, where are you at in the world? Because you're open and like no one's open and I'm always the only one open. Hey, um, yeah, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. So we are actually, I should clarify, um, we have started group fitness because we are able to use the gym. Um, however, we have a multi-purpose building with athletics, so that will end come fall. Um, and also our fitness center opens next Monday. So we started group fitness first to give a handful of people an opportunity, and we have an indoor track they can use currently. And then, um, then we're moving to the fitness center opening next Monday. So cool. So you were asking about closed cleaning periods. That is how we reopened phase one. We picked three windows of time that were peak usage times. And in between there, we were completely closed. We locked it down. We didn't, we weren't even promising to answer the phone and we disinfected our whole facility. That was phase one and they were limited. They were uh, three to four hour time slots, early morning over lunch period and afternoon, early evening. And now we're in phase two and we've widened those time frames so that we are still closed several times a day, but we are closed for shorter time periods. One thing I found in um, one of my former uh, cohorts at the University of Northern Iowa Chris Dennison was asking me like what I had learned and I told him that I thought it was going to take us a really, really long time to clean and disinfect this building. And, you know, so everybody knows we have about a 38,000 square foot building, but it's not taking that long. Like I was getting text messages at night during their end of the day cleaning period, which was supposed to be from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. They were going to clean and disinfect the whole building and they're like, what if we're done? And it was like 8.45. And it was not, as I first assumed, because they were skimping and cutting corners. It really just, with no one there, we, we hardly ever clean with no one there because that's just not how we operate typically. 
with no people in there messing things up or bothering them or calling them or whatever, you can get a lot cleaned and disinfected. So for us, um, finding that time to be closed so that there's no one in the building to disrupt that cleaning procedure, that has been really helpful for us. Um, and for the most part, people have been really cool with it as far as members and patrons. They actually really appreciate that we're spending that time doing it. So that's worked for us. And then we, of course, we're doing it while they're there too. Like, okay, none of the treadmills are being used. Let's give them a good disinfection. But um, yeah, that has worked well for us. I can't say that it will work everywhere, but it works for us. So, Brenna, for us, we were supposed to open July 1st, so we got everything squared away, and then they told us we couldn't open. So, um, but what we did, we Lucky put, you. Yeah. We have, <laughs> okay. uh, we have a, a super small uh, fitness center. It's only about 2,000 square foot. And so we just moved our equipment into stations and just kind of keep the equipment um, relatable to different workouts that people might be doing. So we have a station for dumbbells. We have two half racks and a power rack. So we made three different, if you wanted to do free weights, we have three different stations. And, and so we're also doing reservations. And then on top of that, we're doing kind of what Greta said with, um, well, only we were only going to be open um, during lunch. And then at the, uh, you know, five, five to eight, I think it was. So we, we didn't, we don't have a big, um, a big uh, population of students and staff that show up at 6 a.m. So we decided to just cut that time slot um, and then bring our students in maybe an hour earlier also um, and then keep them an hour after. So we have those extra cleaning, um, that extra cleaning going on before people show up for their, and, and our workout times, we also reduced it. We, it's 50 minutes. So there's a 10 minute, you know, the cleaning uh, section for our staff before the next person comes in, if there is a next person for that uh, station, so. Can I ask a quick question? Do either of y'all's local or state um, guidelines require disinfecting hourly, like ours do? <laughs> ours did not. Okay, and that's what I, I was catching on to, is I think we're special with that yeah. guideline. I think ours did in the first initial reopening wave, Brenna, but I think, they, yeah, um, they didn't we, take it out when our occupancy went up, and I was hopeful they would. <laughs> I think the way I, anybody from Ireland, don't tell, don't turn me in. But uh, the way I'm getting rid of getting around that is, you as a member have always been expected to oh, wipe down your equipment before you and after use, and so it's getting done. Yeah. We well, and that's kind of what I'm too. I'm balancing is that you know we're gonna be constantly disinfecting. So I'm hopeful that that's adequate. Again, um, it's all that balance y'all keep talking about is figuring out what works. And so appreciate the feedback though. I, someone, I saw a question about I am leagues um, as far as for reservations, Rachel maybe asked it, but yes, we are using our IM leagues for um, our, our, I guess our stations, um, but that's the only thing. And then I use it for IM leagues or for intramurals, um, but that's the only thing we have going as far as that goes with IM leagues. I would say ask your, whoever your provider is for that software management system. So I put on the chat, we use a company called Do Sports Easy and they didn't have that module available but they got so many requests and if they're already doing some kind of, you know, check-in software uh, program for your fitness center, group fitness, it's not that complicated on their end to create a reservation system if it's not already on. And I know a lot of other companies have quickly adapted to that. So um, it's, you know, still not too late if you have a software system that doesn't offer it to see if they can throw something together. Um, to create that. So, I, I mean, we asked and they, they were able to re respond pretty quickly and, and put it out there. And Trevor, I'll just, uh, another thought came to mind when you mentioned about the hours, I think. Um, 
you know, this is another area of opportunity, especially I'm assuming as small schools and budget is a big issue for us all. And, and then even further going into this season with COVID and the further cuts that we can maybe be anticipating, you know, that's one area where we can now say, you know, we're going to either open later or close earlier and look at how much we can save in staff time um, for serving, you know, a handful of people who are the early birds or like the coming late. And again, it's not ideal, but we're, I know personally, I was just asked to do a, a budget uh, reduction exercise to show where we could cut, um, which tells me that's kind of on the mind of the university administration. So that's one area where I know a lot of even commercial gyms are now going, gosh, we've been open super early for this handful of people. And, you know, look, and one uh, gym, one commercial gym was telling me, uh, they mentioned that tens of thousands of dollars they would save by just opening an hour later now. And again, for them coming out of this, you know, they're impacted financially. So little things like that, again, this could be the time to make changes, especially for us as small schools where our budgets are probably tight. You know, that's one area where you can save on staff and not really, you know, hurt a lot of people by doing it. Again, if you look at your numbers, typically, it's probably a smaller population that's on the extreme ends of your hours opening or even weekend hours. And in the end, you know, you can maybe save some money on your budget and not have to cut staff. So that's one thing we've been looking at. Can I chime in on those hours? Um, since you mentioned hours, it's Brenna from Missouri Baptist University again. Um, I think I'm struggling with how to approach setting hours for the fall because that does largely fall on me um, for most everything uh, in the semester, within the semester. I mean, based on our usage, I can always propose whatever makes sense. But knowing that I'm going to have less staffing um, now, I'm struggling with how to make those decisions. Do we cut off weekends? Do we cut off that early morning? Is anyone else seeing, you know, I mean, now that we take members out, it is going to affect a little bit, but we have students that come in early morning as well. It might only be a handful though. So that's where I struggle with like, they're paying the bills, you know, so isn't it worth holding open for that handful? Um, so I, I don't know that anybody has any solution, but I'd love to hear thoughts. <laughs> I think you just have to look at your peak hours and go from there. Um, you know, I think that's the easiest way to keep your facility running and to show that, look, these hours we are open, we were really killing it. Um, and I mean, I don't think any of us have a, a big population that shows up at 6 a.m. To, to work out. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I would start there with just looking at your peak hours, see where, you know, the most, your most populated times are. I can't a big population, population just a, just a loud one that's going to complain that would be my that's that would true. be my only just be careful because that <clears throat> might be a small group but they might be a loud group and you got to watch out for that public relations component i cut um weekend hours this summer so we are not open on saturdays or sundays and i've heard a little rattling from people who are like oh i miss my saturdays and sundays no, you don't, because you think you would come in and you would not. And I could look up your attendance and prove it. So I agree with Trevor, rely on your peak times, rely on your attendance data and lean into it. And if somebody's questioning you, because they will, just lean into it harder. I ran the numbers. You're the only one who comes on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Lisa, you were going to say something. No, I'm sorry. You're fine. I was just going to support that and just say for you, Brenna, um, for myself, I am the only professional staff member for campus recreation. I work with student engagement. I also am 28 weeks pregnant. And so, right? Yes, lots of fun. But so the, the, Precious, but, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but the real conversations that we get to have right now are they decided not, they decided to freeze a position underneath me. And now they're facing the reality of, right, it is really hard. And so I think it does give our schools an opportunity to see the value in our positions, especially when you run into a hiccup like that. And so you, you have to decide what's going to work best for you, especially if you're going to be that one person that's covering 
the majority of that staffing and you can lean back on, okay, unless you wanna give me for more funding, unless you wanna provide me the student staff support, you can lean into those things and say, I can offer more hours, but this is the only realistic thing, or you can pay me overtime. Like there's also that opportunity. So I think it does give us a lot of weight and shows the value of what we do, especially when you take away a lot of those, those resources, because that's what our school is facing is, okay, how are we gonna run this? Because we didn't rehire that position under Lisa. And uh, unfortunately she told us she was pregnant right as we were shutting down for quarantine. So that, that's the reality of the situation. I think our schools needs to, to realize that outside of COVID, we all do have other responsibilities and things too. So don't be afraid to list what your needs are as well in a, a professional way, I, as I'm sure everybody on this call knows how to do, but, you know, and talk about that with your supervisor and those people that are supporting you. Lisa, that's a great point, and I'm going to tie it back to the reopening considerations um, because the point you make is something that um, Rob and I and the rest of the reopening work team talked about um, time and time again as we were putting those together and working through what considerations we felt were really necessary. Um, one of the things that you can use those considerations for is leaning into your leadership and administration you know, this is, I'm the content expert, and here is what we need to consider. Here's a checklist of things that we need to, you know, put together and consider. Just utilize those, lean into those considerations, because they were put together with a lot of thought uh, from a group of people that make up a lot of different sizes of universities and programs. Um, and so that was one thing we talked about several times is I think, Rob, you said it earlier today, people, they aren't always thinking about you and they aren't always sharing down the chain. So you may have to use those considerations to share up the chain. I would just add one quick point too. Your reservation system should really help you with your hours because now you can show people <laughs> in real time like what hours are being used and, and be flexible. So the, the model that we were gonna use was a two week plan because we don't know what to expect. We were gonna do reservations during prime time hours and then open up to our capacity in the non prime time hours. And we're gonna do it for two weeks for our, for our weight room and see what happens. And, and people are gonna have to conform. I mean, that's happening across the board in commercial fitness industries because they are now also having to require reservation systems. So it's not ideal where people can just show up whenever they want. They have to say, when are they going to go? And they have to, they have to make the reservation or they're going to be told after so many misses, they're not going to be allowed that opportunity anymore. So it's, it's a two way street. Like we're going to have to make adjustments, but also <laughs> the people that we serve are going to also have to make adjustments. It's not going to be perfect. And I think that's something that you just need to know. It's okay to meet them halfway and you have more tools now by showing, look, this is, these reservation hours are, are not booked. If you really want to work out, if there's any way you can come in at this time, typically this is available. And instead of going, well, I'm going to open an extra hour to keep it available for you. Try to, you know, you are going to have to be smart about your budget and try to fill in the hours to the capacity that's safe that you know that you have. So use that. And with those hours is going to require a lot of communication. So I'm going to tie back to that reopening considerations document again and um, recommend that, that you lean into that communications bucket. We um, There's five different categories of that reopening considerations document. And um, one of the, they're all really important. And what we found is a lot of them intertwine with each other, and I'm sure all of you will see that too. But with that communications bucket, I, in talking with a few colleagues that have asked for, you know, what what things have gone well and what things have not gone well, um, communication is really important to me, and I think we do a really great job of that. But uh, and we all know that you can communicate six, seven, eight different ways and people aren't going to see it. So um, as you're putting together your reopening strategy, as you are 
um, figuring out what those hours are gonna look like and how they can sign up and all those different parameters. Just keep leaning into that communications piece and figuring out how you can communicate as thoroughly as possible. Um, despite numerous methods of communication, literally someone standing at the front door with their face in front of the flyer that said we weren't opening until May 18th, like knocking on our window, people are still gonna say, are you open? When are you open? I didn't see any, okay, well, just my, I guess my recommendation as somebody who is open and is phasing into um, wider amenities and hours and programming is just keep knocking down that communications door. And I guess I talked about phasing um, and we're nearing the end of our time. So cut me off, Chris, if you want to, but we did, uh, especially for facilities bucket on that those reopening considerations, um, you'll see in that opening kind of paragraph of the facilities bucket that we talked about the phased approach. And I don't think that's anything new to most of the people on the call, um, but I, I was speaking with a group from George Mason last month about reopening strategies. And what I shared with them was we structured our phased approach in a way that we could allow a trickle instead of breaking open the dam. So figure out what that looks like for you, whether it's limited hours, limited capacity. Of course, you're gonna need to follow your state guidelines, your public health guidelines, your institutional guidelines. But if you can find a way to slowly reopen, um, I feel fortunate that I got to reopen during the summertime, but whatever you can do to phase it in and then keep that communication part of it going, letting them know that this is a phased approach to reopening. As we can, we will, we will open to a greater extent. We will add back programming. We will X, Y, Z and, and beyond. Um, the, the reopening considerations really focuses um, on phase one and the considerations outline, you know, what, what you need to think about in phase one, but it can apply to phase two and phase three. Um, for us, phase one was super restrictive and phase two was, a, is, is, we're in phase two right now, um, brought back some programming like basketball court usage and group fitness um, and personal training. And we don't have a timeline on any of these. Phase three, we have not even gotten ready for. Um, so just, I mean, take a look at that as you're planning that strategy, if you have not already put together a plan um, to, and proposed it to your administration. Yeah, I think, I think proper planning, and I'm back from my lightning timeout now. So uh, got, got sidelined by that, with some storms rolling through. But yeah, proper planning is really what it's all going to be about, and realizing that plans can and will change. I think being flexible enough to understand that that will change. So, well, as we're heading towards the end of the hour, you know, I want to thank you know, all of our two guests for joining us today, taking some time out of their day to you know, really talk with us about how to you know, reopen and just give us some of the best insights and best pointers that are out there right now. And for all their hard work, again, thank you for you know, all that hard work on the, um, the task or the work group as well for getting that resource out to our nursing members. It's certainly, certainly valuable. And also thank you to my co-host and cohort and there's the HQ for helping us get this uh, put on today. So everybody stay safe, stay well, stay positive out there. Mm -hmm.